You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible artist. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar. This is Hear Me Out. And I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Neve Walsh. I used to have that mug. Oh, yeah. I had that mug all through drama school. Did you? Oh, snap. Neve, it's because we are both little. And fierce. But we are both fierce. Correct. So I think it's Aww. appropriate. I love this mug. Love that um, mug. I thought I'd have a little bard mug yeah. to do a little chat about the bard. I don't know how long it is since I've actually seen you in person. It's been a very, very long time. Well, I watched uh, stage, so I've seen you, not in person, of course, but I've seen your face more, before you learned more recently than you've seen my face because I've been watching your face. I remember when you were doing Jamestown, you were one of the first people I knew who I saw on like a bus ah. poster, <laughs> you know? I'd be like, I've seen Neve because there she is on a bus, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It was one of those really lovely surreal moments. You're like, cool, I know people on buses yeah. now. Like, great. Yeah. <laughs> How was that for you? Was that like when you were first on a bus, on a London bus, did you go out and like with your family and try to spot a London bus with you? This is the first time hearing I was on a bus. Oh my God, yeah. I swear you, I had, you were on a bus. I know, I, I believe you. I had no idea that we were on buses. That's great. It was billboards. It, there was a billboard in Oxford Circus like underground station and that was the one that we like took a little trip to like stand in front yes. of the thing and like take it off or like it me um oh my god of course that was you the must. fun one because if why like when i'll see you like gonna not but then it's also must. hilarious because i obviously you know it's like with like hair and makeup like i on the poster look nothing like the girl standing like in front of the thing so people are just like why is that girl standing in front of that photo of someone that's a blessing like though her? isn't it like 100%. oh my god what a great thing that like you look so different but then i have also had that in situation in my life where people have been like I'm, in, I'm like, I'm in this thing and they're like, oh, I've, I've, I've seen that thing. Which one are you in it? And I'm like, I'm the one like with the lead. my face. <laughs> the one with my voice. The one who is me. I don't know how to, like, I'm wearing a wig. So but like, I my hate God. that. When people are like, I recognize you, but I don't recognize you. So funny story. Like at the end of 2020, I went to a pub out here in Oxfordshire and the waitress was this really lovely girl who was very chatty and she was getting on with me and my husband really well and at some point in the end she was like I'm really sorry to ask but like are you an actress or something and I like never I don't think I'd really have that ever before and I and you know my husband was going apoplectic he was so excited you know he was like she is she is you know and this waitress was like oh have I seen you in something and this was obviously shortly after stage to come out so I was like you yes. might have done you know and then before I can say anything she starts guessing and it's the age-old story where like she guesses every show in the world that I've never got an audition for you know like she's like no. down no. to Abbey they came no. of thrones casualty <laughs> no and eventually she's like oh what is it then and I was like staged and she's like nah never no. heard of it. <laughs> it was Michelle Dockery it was just someone else who looks like you <laughs> that's probably it that's probably it that's probably she's it. a big down fan and you look oh, a lot God. like that one that's probably anyway right the speech. Yes. <laughs> what play is it from? Who says it? Give me a little intro. So it is by William Shakespeare, because of course it is. Because I did try. I really genuinely tried to think about literally any other writer, living or dead. And I came up with a couple, but it's just got to be, it's got to be the guy. I think he's a genius. Um, and it's Hermione from The Winter's Tale. And it is, let me get this up here. It's, I always forget. It's Act 3, Scene 2. Well done. I read that. Off the oh right, okay. I did not remember that. In well my done brain. for reading. Well done to the internet. So when uh, when I asked you about the speech, as you just mentioned there, you tried to think of a few other things. You couldn't find one that you loved anywhere near as much as this. What made this immediately spring to mind? I was lucky enough to do this play and play this character, and every single night, it, it's, I mean, it's great. It's a banger. It's full of like she's got. She's lucky. She's kind of a speech lady. She's got a lot. But every single yeah. night when I got to this bit, I just was like extremely in my element, and it was the best crack I've ever had on stage. And I just think it's a banger. I think everything to do with any situation, the way that it's been staged, the things you could do with it, the way that it's written, what like who she is, what she's doing. I just think it's mm -hmm. magic. I completely agree with you, and I haven't been in Winter's Tale, but I have. Hermione is one of my like cannot wait would love to like she is so awesome and actually I think it's an interesting one like there's a couple of awesome people like Paulina Correct. is another 
cracker Bang in, in the winter's tale and also what's underrated when people talk about like their favorite like you know everyone's like oh cleopatra like lady macbeth like nobody's talking about hermione and paulina paulina in particular and when i saw the rsc the actress playing paulina well it was like hermione who like it was like it was the paulina show it was yeah. incredible <laughs> yeah and like when um kenneth branagh did it it was the queen judy dench uh-huh. was paulina yes. absolutely show stealing spellbinding perfection so can you give in case there's anyone listening who hasn't ever seen or read the winter's tale can you give a brief synopsis of it and who hermione is and what's happening in this moment i surely can so hermione and leontes are the king and queen of i always get this wrong bohemia they're the bohemians and uh they love each other and have a wonderful relationship they've got a baby mamilius a, a mm-hmm. son And uh, Leontes mate, Polixenes, is over from Sicilia and he's going to go home and he's been there for nine months. And uh, Leontes says, you should stay. And then Hermione's like, yeah, you should totally stay. And she convinces him to stay. And then Leontes immediately shits the bed and uh, thinks that she's cheating on him. And there's a phenomenal uh, line where he says that they are, they're uh, paddling palms and pinching fingers. Which was like that's the mm. best like example of just like when and when you when you are suspicious of somebody when you think that somebody's doing something it's just the best example of like sort of sneaky flirting that I've ever heard of like a with mm. what I'm like I've done that I've sort of been flirt trying to flirt with someone and like pinched palms and paddle fingers like that's like horrible but like it's so great so he gets this into his head and he accuses her of infidelity and Polixenes he tries to kill Polixenes but Polixenes gets out of town. And so there's this huge trial. Basically, he says, I'm going to put her on trial. She goes into labor, premature labor, because she's pregnant for the whole thing. She goes into premature mm-hmm. labor. Yeah, pregnant with the second child. Yes, but to a daughter. So she gives birth to a daughter and then is hauled out for this trial mm-hmm. and gives this speech as kind of her testimony. And we know that Shakespeare does legal, like women in court situations and sort of women testifying and, and like and giving depositions really beautifully. So she gives this incredible deposition and basically says, you don't scare me, um, kill me. Whatever you're going to do, uh, the death penalty, like it, I, I, I don't care. Um, the war, You've already done the worst possible thing you could do to me, which is everything that you've done. I happen to be a massive fan of the speech that comes just before this. Sure. It's one of my favourite speeches. Is there a reason why, to sort of explain to the listener, that they both say a similar thing? They're both effectively saying, in short, how dare you? My honour is all I care about. And do with me whatever you want. You're a fucking idiot. Yeah. Excuse my French. That's it. Um, is there a reason why this one that you've picked, the one that begins, Sir, spare your threats, was more evocative for you than the other one? Was it just a matter of like, you know, you had the lead up of the other one and then this? Or was there a particular line or something? You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Because I didn't get that. I mean, it's a feeling. It's a totally like like a feeling when you suddenly sort of feel like you're not in your body anymore and you're just like and I didn't get it with the one before for me the one before is the prep it's the like little lead up but she finds you, the one before is where she has that she she, she explains she has that great line where she says uh, it's, uh, it's not my honour that I care about the only the reason I care about my honour is because it passes on to my kids that's what I care about yes. that the, I'm going to die and I don't care because the dead body has got no honour but she's like the only thing I care about is that it goes through the line and I care about my kids mm. and that's where you're going to yes. get me that's where you can hurt me So for me, that was the kind of, that's, the, that's, she's sort of like rolling into it and kind of explaining, being like, here's why I'm about to say everything that I'm going to say. And also this is really tacky, but the final line of this one is Apollo be my judge. That for me is a like, <laughs> mic drop. And that's it. That's all you get from me. I don't, I can't, I'm not, I can't be certain if she speaks much after that, but like that she kind of says her piece and then she turns into a statue and even then she barely talks about it. Like that she kind of goes and I'm done. I I, I'm not explaining myself to you anymore because you are, you are insane and, and you're, you're, you can't be appealed to with logic. And the first thing she says, I think it's in that first speech where she says, what am I going to say? Not guilty. Like you already think I'm a liar. So there's a point. I love that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think this is a classic. Um, there is a way Hermione speaks, I think, that I don't know that I've seen in other at least female characters that I, I know relatively well in Shakespeare, which is she has this incredible way of like, just barreling through she has these long sentences that make perfect sense but they're sort of so long-winded it's almost like she has this great ability to not let you interrupt her end stop lines just don't really happen like there's i'm looking now there's like one you're absolutely right oh my god you're absolutely right Look, like one or two ooh. right at the start spare oh your god, threats you're absolutely right you know it's like she just goes like you i'm gonna say my bit and you are not coming in <laughs> you've hit the nail on the head because as we know like 
it is a challenge. You have to kind of, and I've, I've, I've met women nowadays and women, women in positions of power who have learned to go. And the other thing is, and if you just let me finish, and I think you'll find that you have to, have to throw in these little verbal cues to be like, don't talk yet. Like it's not your bit yet. In fact, I think there's a thing that they said that there's a sort of, there's a thing in female patterns of speech where we, that have been historically denigrated by, especially like Scott, sort of white male scholars of speech, where they talk about vocal fry and like ums and ahs, that women actually have this vocal fill in that it's like, no, that's a social thing. Like it's, it's a way of being like, I'm listening and I'm taking in what you're saying. And also like, I'm sort of giving you, and it means please don't interrupt me because I'm, if you go, uh, uh, it's like, I'm not done. And I love, I love about the way she speeches in this speech in particular, the one, um, her speech patterns. She loves a list. She loves like, here's what we're going to talk about. Bam, bam, bam. I mean, Shakespeare loves a list, but she loves like sort of setting out what mm. she's going to say and then being like, and here I go, because you can't interrupt me when I get to point two, because I told you there's going to be three. So don't start with me <laughs> yes. now. Yes. Uh, what are we on? We're on Yeah, two. exactly. So one. I'm not done. Yes. And it's why, I mean, thinking about it now in the kind of a modern context, like it's so, so relevant because she's talking about honor and about people's opinion of you and what people can say about you. And it's still so powerful, particularly with women, that women are still being killed for this, being murdered, yeah. hailed out to murder. Like that is not an old dusty concept at all. No. The idea of being able to say whatever you want and it affecting people's lives without any kind of check in base in fact or reality is a, is a very 2022 mm-hmm. problem, I think. And it's killing people. Absolutely. He's writing about this, you know, back in the day, he's writing about the absolute power that someone, if someone is the king and says something about you, that's it she's lucky because she has the oracle to kind of appeal to the sort of their version of a dna test or whatever but which she does (laughs) she she appeals to she has to appeal to absolute like binary true or false because he won't was there a certain line you know were there certain bits you absolutely loved throwing out that's so funny you say that is such an actor thing isn't it that like you could there are like some juicy speeches but there are some bits that you're just like just sounds juicy it's fun to say i mean weirdly it's sort of, it's right at the start that when she says the bug which you would fright me with, I see it because that is just like, mm, nah, so nice to say. And you can kind of bug, you can like really punch him with it. And it, it's so, it's such a weird, unexpected, she doesn't say threat or like danger or violence. Yeah, the bug which you would fright me with, I see. And, and when she says, uh, now my liege, right? When she's done her list, that she's like, I've, I've laid out my case for you. So now my leash yeah. and the subtext of my leash is of course you asshole yeah i mean yeah. also myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet just because that's fun to say myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet like that's like num 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 like very tasty in the mouth to say that's so true there's so many lines that feel just it sounds so weird but like they feel nice in your mouth that is a lot of shit take that literally... quote out of context <laughs> but one of my favorite lines it was, it's from uh much about nothing and hero says what kind of catechizing call you this beautiful what kind so of nice. I call you this and i've got to be careful that i know we sort of we're gonna like you sort of do the speech at the end but when i was thinking about it kind of going back to it i've got this weird impulse which i know i did when i did it to say um sir spare your threats to make her like posh and like take the r out and like not sound like me and do it in rp oh rather than like sir spare your threats which is how i talk it's so, yes. because in my mind and it goes back to when we did it because i was obviously like like 20 something in my mind, she's a queen, and still in my mind, even though I've tried to, like, decolonize my thinking, like, I'm like, still in my mind, queens, they say sir, they don't say sir, even though that's bullshit. And when he was writing it, we know from whatever academics have done that, like, RP is a very modern invention, and, like, he yes. probably sounded much closer, he probably had a rotig art, like, but I have to, I had to myself, I had to be like, why are you doing, why are you saying sir? And, like, it, if you think about it, it's, it's come through, it's been watching, like, a lot of TV lately, and just being like, we still fully are, like, posh people and queens speak in RP yeah. and sort of like little funny characters like speak like me or they're from the West Country or they're Scottish or they've got like little accents like but that's like that is a, a horrendous way of thinking how do you find doing accents Are I love them happy with accents yeah I like them I love them like I say I was lucky I grew up uh, in a place with a lot of accents so I've got kind of like a good ear for it and I kind of have like a sort of quasi weird transatlantic thing going on so I'm not sort of pinned to anything I, I almost kind of have to do them with every part that I find that I have never yet done a part that it sounds like me. Really? Because I, I was about to say, I was, I'd was i noticed a few. I was like, I know that you've obviously done, you've done a sort of RP, you've done German, you've done like a different type of Irish. Yeah, yeah, German, RP. What was Jamestown? Jamestown was Irish, but not me. Because this is a very modern kind of like twangy American Irish. So Jamestown was Irish, mm. but not me. And Smother was Irish, but not me. Because that was like West, mm. West of Ireland. And I, I, and again, there was no reason for in Smother. The, and even in Jamestown, there's no reason why they can't sound exactly like me. But they just never do. Like, and and I sort of find it comforting. It's like the wig. It's like putting on the corset. 
you like put on yeah. the voice and then it is like not you. And then also crucially, you could take it off uh, at the end of the yes. day, which is very just as important to like be able to leave it somewhere and not kind of bring it home with you. Very true. What is your favorite accent to do? Ooh. Oh, good question. I speak French and nobody's yet let me do a French accent. Oh. And I really, I'm like to Asian, I'm like, I do a banging French accent. I'm like, just let me, let me loose. But my absolute least is RP. Is it? Loose. I, if I could just open my mouth and sound like you, I would be <gasps> so happy. I can't do it. I just, because I do that thing, I, 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 I just like turn into Mary Poppins I can't I can't separate it from the class thing in my mind at all so I had an interesting thing where I was at school like very young I want to say I was like seven six or seven um, and I was at quite a posh school and I remember these two girls who were my friends one day being like you say one funny and I was like one and it was like this funny thing they weren't being mean like they were friends of mine but they were in absolute raptures they were like one and I was going one and it went back and forth and I kept being like hey I'm nuts like we're saying the same sound anyway fast forward 15 years and I'm at Lambda and we're in our RP lesson and the teacher was like so Lucy you need to bear in mind that of course you're generally RP but you say one funny <laughs> and they were like so if you're playing an RP part you need to amend the way you say that sound it's basically because I think my mum grew up in Liverpool and I don't think I can hear a Liverpudlian accent but if she meets other Liverpudlians they're immediately like Liverpudlian it's like they can hear and she obviously has that quite Liverpudlian or quite northern like one rather than an RP speaker would say one one like what I got told was um an RP speaker if they won a single award they would say I won one it would be exactly the same sound whereas I would say I won one okay so that is like black magic to me that's insane and was it the genius Mary Howland who said this to your lambda Mary Howland, Mary Howland is a, a moment genius. And I still, to this day, I will email her with a self-tape coming up and be like, Mary, German, <laughs> help. Oh God, oh, like, ladies and gentlemen, look up Mary Howland, get her in your life in any way if you can, because she's actually, I still use the phonetics. Like I, I have some grasp of phonetics because I like trained with Mary Howland and she's a total Absolutely. genius. And she picked up on this thing that your friends picked up on 15 years ago because she's a genius. Okay, right. Let me check my little list for, um, for other things that I want to bring up. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to pick out a bit that I thought was really cracking in your speech, which is to just return to us talking about the fact that she doesn't let anyone speak. And we already mentioned that there aren't many end stop lines, meaning there aren't many lines where punctuation, like at the end of a line showing that like, like a poem, you can just like take a breath. But there's one bit where near the end, she asks all these questions, she puts her case forward, like you said, and then she says, therefore proceed. Full stop, end of a line. And then she goes, but yet hear this. And I love that even more than what we were saying before about she carries on and, you know, you can't stop. I love how with Shakespeare in particular, I think there's such a lovely, um, in an interview with Toby Stevens on the show, he talks about the ambiguity of Shakespeare and what a gift it is that it can be really ambiguous. And I think here it's like, I love that. You could play it as, Therefore, proceed, brief breath, but hear this, as in almost funny, not funny, but you know, actually, no, don't proceed yet. But you could also read that and play that as, therefore, proceed, stop. No one fucking says anything because she is so, she has so silenced them. And then, so then she takes an opportunity to go, okay, one more thing then, if no one's going to speak. I really get the hots for fun, like verse structure in Shakespeare. I just think there's so much fun to be had in like what what he's telling us, what Shakespeare's telling us in just the structure of how he's written it. That's why it's going to be Shakespeare, right? Because with him, you, you can just be so sure that you're like, he meant it. And also I understand there's a whole range of scholarship about like how much did he mean it? How much was he just doing it? How much, like, and I think it's something in the middle. I do not by any means think the guy sat down with a quill and was like, I'm going to put an end stop here because of it. But he just was a genius. So like, it's like Bach, Beethoven, yes. they're composing. It just comes through anyway. And I think the reason that they don't, that even were there to be a pause there, which there is, you're at a rare enough pause in this kind of like sort of barreling like list. The only reason no one does interrupt and the reason that they wouldn't is because she's made it so clear. She's put, laid out this beautiful list and she's made it so clear that she's not going to go, therefore proceed and this is fine. They'd all be standing there in absolute terror, like therefore proceed. It's like when somebody when somebody's mad at you and they go, no, no, go on. You're like, hey, I don't want to. And you can absolutely, like, <laughs> she has, she, with the speech before as well, she's laid it out so clearly that you know this is not going to be the ending. You absolutely know she's not done when she goes, therefore it's fine. 
And also, I mean, the whole thing with this is like, and like this, like the way that it's been staged before is that, the, like, it's one of my favorite things about it that she's just given birth. Yes. When else do we get that in a show? And there's amazing productions of it. Some of some 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 shows have her come on in a gown, a blood stain, get dripping blood yeah. on the floor, yeah, like which I think is, yeah. is incredible. Just like show them, beat them over the head with it, and like they're doing it. I mean, let's talk about Twenty Strangers Do. I'm obsessed with House of the Dragon at the moment. I think that for finally we're getting, we've seen the violence of sword playing, jousts, and guns and, and bows and arrows for like enough. Finally, people are getting yeah. brave enough to show like the violence of, of the women that were behind the scenes, the violence of childbirth, the violence of what that means, how to give birth on your own, how to like a bloodstained birthing sheet is just as horrifying as kind of a bloodstained shroud like in battle. I've seen I've seen shows where she's like literally dripping on the floor. Also, I've seen it where they they have sort of gussied her up like she's dressed again like the queen and she's got like a crown on and she's trying to kind of retain that authority of queen. But you never forget that there's a baby in the room that she's just given birth to. So there's power in that as well, that she actually is trying to still be the queen, mm. trying to keep it together. Uh, she says it, that you, the worst thing you did to me is denied me the privilege of the childbed. You son of a bitch. Like, you, you dragged me out here. One of the most valuable things, which belongs to women of all fashion, which everyone gets, the stable girl gets to give birth and be at peace. And you have even denied yeah. me that and I'm the queen. You've made, you've hauled me out here. And part of her horror is how public it is. She's horrified. Like, that you didn't allow me the kind of the privilege of uh, the sanctity of, and of kind of privacy. You've, you've done this in public, which is the, the danger of it as well. The fact, that, the fact that this all is happening in public is why I have to die. Because the publicity of it, the, the honor, that's, that's what's fatal to me. And fuck you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's a banger. <laughs> I mean, right, that's it. It's like it's you were saying, so like, you, you can, you, you, I mean, there's obviously like phenomenal modern writer's work and also contemporary to him, but it's just something about, and it's so effortless, right? Like the genius of it is that you don't, it's not dead. You don't read it like, oh yes, it's very worthy, very sensible, like words. And, and, and But the minute you start pulling it apart, it's all there. Like, and that, I think that was mm. what Lambda was really good about, that they never sort of said to us, you have to sit down with a pen and paper and make this sort of very dry and dead. But if you do want to do that and you start, it is all there. I always feel actually that was one of the things I really loved about Lambda was that it had a sense of like every lesson you went into every different technique you were taught there was a sense of like come in this room and take it seriously for an hour and then if you don't like it throw it in the bin on the way out 100%. we don't care pick and choose what works and you're making your toolbox you're constructing your mm. own toolbox and I still use it you would get like you would get like a telly the tiniest like gnarliest most modern little tiny telly I'm still using all that stuff like it goes in the toolbox um one last question before I get you to read it no. talking about brilliant writing have you done any, because obviously you have ended up doing more telly than theatre. Have you had any telly writing where you've been really like, this is nice, juicy? Ooh. Because I feel as a general rule that telly is brilliant and those writers are incredibly skilled, but it tends to be a less eloquent medium or a medium where like the wordplay, you know, there's something inherently theatrical about wordplay. So a lot of the time I think a telly script can feel much more... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like practical. You've hit the you're completely right. And also like they've got to do that. The whole goal of TV is mm. honesty. You've got to tell the truth. It's like brutal and kind of gritty honesty because if the camera's there and you're lying or you're being theatrical in any way, it will like tell. I have mm. seen some massive, what we would call theatrical, because I don't think it's to do with size. I think that's it. People think it's to do with size. They think it means, they think the telly means small and theatre is big and it's the complete opposite. It's because I've seen huge telly acting, big Shakespearean performances. And I think that's what they're doing on Thrones at the moment. So I love it so much. They are doing like Lear and Macbeth. They are doing big, fat Shakespearean yeah. performances. And it's totally worked because there's dragons in that show and it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> but like, if you were going, and I've seen people do that in Holby and it's and it's beautiful. But if you are going for realism, right, they who have got to aim for kind of like a small, yeah, a more truthful way of speaking, which is not, nobody talks, you, you and I are umming and ahhing, well, nobody talks like this in mm -hmm. real life unless they've written it out and they've kind of thought about it. It is theatrical and it's magical. Mm. I, I once had a, this, I once had a uh, audition for a TV show, which was so very, very bad. And it then got made and it was very, very bad. And um, it was a monologue, like a speech like this. They were aiming for like this kind of like big Shakespearean thing. And the first line of, it was a monologue, which you, you rarely get in telly, right? You rarely get. Very it's conversation is all dialogue. Because then yeah. life people interrupt each other. And it, I was like, oh, cool. This is a speech. And the, it was about how she was feeling. And the first line of the speech was, let me tell you how I'm feeling. <laughs> I was like, lines, words, no human being has ever said to it ever in, in the history of the world. No human being has ever looked at another human being gone, let me tell you how I'm feeling. Like, I was I'm just like, like what's, oh, the, what's the phrase? Like, show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. This was hell, tell, tell. This is all tell. Literally, let me tell you how I'm feeling. And then she did. Uh, and I was like, well, it was not Shakespeare, let me tell you. Yeah. The closest I've, I've been really, I've been really lucky. 
I've worked with some like amazing writers. The closest I've come to this kind of thing, I, but it's funny, you sort of do need to go back in time. It was Jamestown, I think. You sort of do need to be doing something, mm. period, because in like something set in 2022, we just don't, we're far less eloquent. I also think I'm fascinated by, have you seen those old video, like BBC clips of like kids, school kids in the 1960s? And they no. all speak in these like, they go like, what are you like at school? And these kids were like, well, personally, my most academic, like they all speak in these like <laughs> beautiful, fully formed clauses and like beautiful cliff accents. I'm like, oh God, we've all, our minds have been so, I speak for myself, yeah. our minds have been so rotted that like we've totally lost that sense of like, kind of eloquence and I mean not to be like kids these days because we've also gained a lot but so you kind of have to go back in time because it would be weird if you were doing that like on the bill if you were like speechifying of course now people are doing it in Mary Sound and Breaking Bad like people are now writing succession I feel like I've actually right I was about to say I have had to in this series in the episodes already out in this series we have had to edit out how many times I bring up succession (laughs) because it's beginning to look weird (laughs) And it's like, it's fine if it comes up once, maybe even twice, but like can't happen every conversation. But I, ha- but it is so, it has to be said here, succession is one of those really rare things where it's utterly modern and it's utterly real. And yet they speak the writing in that, like even you just think like quotes, like every episode you come away at the end being like, I actually for Christmas last year as like little so- stocking filler Christmas presents for my brother and my husband, got like a personalized notebook made with a succession quote on the front because there were quotes that were like so funny like um one of our favorites in my family was um that's a 12 inch sub of poison tree frogs or something it was like the idea of like having to do something really awful later the day was like eating a 12 inch sub of poison tree frogs (laughs) and that is shakespeare it's Shakespeare. And that is Shakespeare. That is modern day Shakespeare. But actually, that whole show is Shakespeare. That's why it's, it's like that and dragons. Like they are doing, they are lit because they are doing, I mean, that's Lear. That's just, it's Lear. It's Hamlet. Like it's Macbeth. It's all about succession. And who, I mean, it's, it's Hermione. It's what yeah. do your kids get? Who is your, who is your direct line of lineage? And they, they sit around boardroom tables like in, and they live in castles essentially. And they talk like that and they're dealing with matters of state. And they, so the, the language is, and it gets away with it. Because it can be that heightened. Maybe because the world they live in is so heightened that like it absolutely, it is Shakespeare. It's Shakespearean. Mm-hmm. Before, again, I need to get you to read it and then we need to stop. But um, can I quickly ask, how much fun was it to make Sandman? The most fun. Can I tell you the weirdest thing about Sandman? Which was that it was the most fun in the world. I'm like a massive fan. I've like, I've read it since I was 14. I'm like a super duper like Neil Gaiman hyper fan. So I was already like, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. just being in that world. And it was the sort of swizziest thing I've done. It was like DC and Netflix. And like, so like the trailer was very swizzy, the gift bag, everything about it was like quite swizzy. And I was like, oh, okay. The gift bag. Babe. So you like, get like, exactly. I was like, not expecting a gift bag. You go to the trailer, which is already the trailer is like swizzier than a really tiny thing. I walked in, there was like a scented candle that had already been lit. And there was like this beautiful gift bag that was full of all these like beautiful cashmere like stuff. And I was like, oh, now, now we're playing with the big boys. Like now we're, now we're in Swiss town. Okay. I get it. You're like, I am going to add scented <laughs> candle to my rider. 100% in cashmere from now on, now on. And now I'm at the big time. I think it's so funny, though, like celebs who don't need loads of free stuff get so much free stuff. Like I remember like 10 years ago or something, I was helping Vanessa Kirby do a self-tape. And at the time she was going out with Douglas Booth and he had gone to like some big award ceremony the night before and had come back with so many freebies. It was like a cardboard box full of freebies in the living room. And she was like, oh, babe, do you want to help yourself to anything you want in the box? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and it was box. like a lucky dip for adults it was so much fun I was like yes I was like oh my god I'm gonna take this hairbrush I'm gonna take these little like Ugg boots I'm gonna take these little like oh my god there was so much and some sunglasses that I took out of there that were Vogue right which isn't a brand but is obviously a brand like Vogue had made some sunglasses and I, I had these sunglasses they lasted me for like seven years I loved them and then I left them in a bloody Uber in LA five years ago and I was so sad and they were like one off made for this thing made for the box yes. you never get them again you can't buy them you can't oh. place them because they came out of the box anyway sorry back to your uh, gift bag and your trailer and also it's like it's like really pathetic that this is the thing that people know so you're like how was sound and I'm like but let me tell you about the gift bag right but like yeah. the only thing you know so I sort of got on set and I was like oh okay okay it's so like here this is the world that we're in and then we got on set and immediately immediately it was so evident that it was the same job it was Hobby City, it was Jamestown, it was mm. Lambda, it was York, it was it was University, it was it's so I'm so not swizzy in a way, in, a, in, the, in the best way possible that immediately became clear that I was like, oh, this is we're all still doing exactly the same job, and none of the swizziness had kind of seeped into the actual making of the thing. Like when it comes to the making of the thing and Brilliant. the standing and the talking and the being, it was just like, oh yeah, this is the same job. 
I was like, thank God and for that. I have that. to say, it's all about making a great team. And I tweeted about this when I watched Sandman. But it was one of those shows where I feel like throughout the f- whole first episode, almost every scene, someone cropped up who I think is a very talented actor and a lovely person. Whether it was like a, quite a major role like yours or even just like one of the guys who's the guard in the room that the Sandman's being kept in. It was like big or small they were all humans that I just, I really rate and I really like. And I was like, whoever has cast it, like the casting team and Neil and whoever's directing it, they obviously have an eye for just a good person in a good team, which is so interesting. And you really do get a sense of like projects where people have been picked for reasons other than being talented and nice. And then the ones where people are talented and nice. And like, of course the show was a great success because what a gang doing it and that maybe that you've hit the nail on the head maybe that's what I felt maybe that's why because that was the feeling the absolute feeling when you walked on was like oh this is just uh this is just rehearsal this is just this is the job Mm. this is the totally Mm. normal job that we've all done amazing right Neve let's do the speech all right right, I'm just getting rid of my camera because I can't be looking at myself yes of course I understand sir spare your threats The bug which you would fright me with, I seek. To me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favour, you do give lost. For I do feel it gone, but know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits of my body from his presence I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred, most unluckily, is from my breast. The innocent milk in its most innocent mouth hailed out to murder. Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet. With immodest hatred, the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion. And lastly, hurried here to this place the open air, before I have got strength of limit. Now, my liege, you tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore proceed. But yet hear this, and this take me not. No life. I prize it not a straw, but for mine honour, which I would free. If I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proofs sleeping else but what your jealousies awake, I tell you tis rigour and not law. Your honours all, I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo be my judge. absolutely fabulous yeah, she is loved it <laughs> and i feel like the listener should know that we have been talking for an hour and a half and i'm gonna have to find some way of cutting this down to 35 minutes 35 minutes oh my god i'm so sorry it was my bed you have nothing to apologize for <laughs> it is such it has been such a joy and i would rather have too much conversation than too little what a pleasure man thank you so much that, that is like the most fun i've had in weeks that was great crap. oh thank you so stop much. say it again <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast. Music composed by Tristan Kay and artwork by Rebecca Bright. Our heartfelt thanks to the estates and license holders that allow us to read our guests' speech choices. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please, please subscribe, rate, and review. You can follow us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out and enjoy visual clips of the interviews on our YouTube channel. Finally, if you would like to support Hear Me Out, go ahead and click the Patreon link at the bottom of the episode bios.